All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. All right, and continue to drop in and let us know where you're coming in from. Here's a question for a check in. What's the highlight of your day so far? It's Monday. Anybody having a happy Monday? Can I get some thumbs up? Let me know you're all right. Okay. So I'm Dakri Brooks. I'm the director of storytelling for the HE But Foundation. Welcome, everyone. Um, our goal with this project, which is the Narrative Change Project, is to tell more complete stories about our neighbors. And um, this year, we're planning to host several events, learning experiences, and workshops so that we can get to, go to know our neighbors. So you'll definitely want to make sure that you stay connected with us. And we're going to let you know how you can do that towards the end of this session. But one of our neighbors and close friends of the foundation is Dr. Carrie Lattimore. He's here with us today. He's a historian and professor of, Af of African American history at Trinity University. And some of you may remember him from our first virtual session last year where he actually came on and talked about uh, some of, Afri of San Antonio's African-American leaders from the civil rights movement. And that was so educational and it was a conversation with him and my colleague, Patton Dodd. So it's a pleasure to have him back. And you know, before y'all hopped on here, Jessica, uh, Jessica wave hi, she's our tech support. So if you have any questions, be sure to tag Jessica. Um, but um, so, we were having a conversation and we were saying just how excited and lucky we feel because Dr. Carrie Lattimore's book, Unshakable Faith, which I'm holding right here, just came out like fresh off the press. And I feel very special because as you could see right here, what I'm pointing to is an autographed copy. So, um, and we should feel very special because I believe Carrie said this is the first session that he's having officially with an audience to talk about his book. Is that right, Carrie? I did a thing on KSAT for Christmas, um, but this is the first time we'll be extended beyond like six minutes. So it's exciting. It is very exciting. It's very exciting. So a couple things, housekeeping. One is this is an interactive discussion. I'm gonna start off with a, a 20 minute Q&A with Carrie. And then we're gonna follow that with about 20 minutes of audience Q&A. So definitely you can hold on to your questions, but just know you can also be dropping questions in the chat because Jessica and is going to help us with making sure that your questions get answered when we get to the audience Q&A part of this session. So I wanna dive right in, all right? So officially, Carrie, I'm welcoming you back. Um, I'm very excited. I actually had a chance to read your book over the holidays. And one of the things that I absolutely loved about the book was how you started the book with a dedication to your mother. You said she taught you the power of prayer. And I want to, I want to know, what do you think she would say about this book, Unshakable Faith? I hope that she would say that she likes it. Um, I would, you know, that's my hope and prayer, but I of course. know that um, she would. Um, it's something that we discussed before I, um, my mother had sickle cell anemia, um, which is a really horrific genetic disorder. Um, I don't have it, um, but my mother did and she survived for 79 years. And so when you survive something like that, and for those who know anything about sickle cell anemia, it's a very, it's a, it's a horrific disorder and it can cause tremendous pain. And I saw my mother in many cases in a lot of pain. Um, and so in those times, all she had was prayer in a sense and her faith. And so those first teachings that I remember as seeing my mother in pain, um, but how she handled it and how, you know, when you see people kneeling at a bed in prayer, my father and my mother, um, it teaches you a lot about the power of prayer and suffering. And we might talk about suffering at, at a point as well. Um, but that's, you know, and I, I took all of those things in, in a sense. And so I would hope that the lessons that she taught me weaved its way into this text. And I think that it has. Um, and that's why I dedicated it to her, because in so many ways, my mother and my father, I owe almost everything to them and the way that they raised me, the things that they taught me the lessons that I learned from them. Um, in many ways, I hope that I live up to their expectations. That's my hope and my dream and my prayer. 
that I live up to their expectations. I love that. So just to orient this group a little bit, because the, the title is Unshakable Faith, African-American Stories of Redemption, Hope, and Community. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, I guess, what, what led you um, to, write, to write the book? What led you to write this book? And, and when did you actually like dot it and, and finish the book? What was the process? You know, the process was kind of a haphazard way. Um, a number of years ago, I had the opportunity to write a book for Urban Ministries, which is a um, African-American um, company that works for, that delivers Sunday school, vacation Bible school materials. It's one of the first, it's one of the largest African-American book companies around. And so they had me write a book for them. And I thought to myself, this was kind of a vocation that was important for me because I am an ordained minister and I'm also a professor. And in many ways in my professor role, I sometimes have separated that ministerial part of me and I, being a professor is a ministry and I see it as that, but I have this side of me and I'm not always working on that other side of who I am. And so this part got, gave me the ability and opportunity to link um, that spiritual side of me with the historical piece. And so I put that together and I um, went to a conference and we were um, talking about the book and I met a woman for our Daily Bread um, publishers. Her name was Joyce Dinkins, a tremendous, wonderful African-American woman. And we started talking and she said, do you have a book in your spirit? And I said, I'm thinking of one. Um, she said, let's talk. And so it began a series of conversations and you know, the idea of the book came out of these people in the book, a lot of them I've taught in my classroom and I learned about their spiritual side as well. And so I was like, I could talk about it historically, but I could also talk about it in a spiritual, a Christian level. And so that's kind of the real point of the book is to bring these two vocations into one, to unite these two pieces of me in a sense of unity. Um, in a sense, it brings me together as well. Um, and so that's kind of how I see the book Unshakable Faith is um, kind of a coming home in a sense for me. I come home to my um, profession as a professor, but I also come home to that profession as a minister. And that is the foundation of who I was since birth. I love that. That's, that's great context for the book. And so, um, you know, early on in the first chapter, you start with this story of of Paul and you share about a little bit about how Paul's faith helped him to move beyond seeing people through a socioeconomic lens. You actually called it socioeconomic prejudice. Can you just share a little bit more about what led you to that story of Paul in particular and how it's relevant into in the ways in which we view and are, and are in relationship with each other today? You know, there are so many ways in which the Bible has often been manipulated by people for bad causes and yet at the same time there's so many stories that are so that are so much about liberation in the bible text and we are, the exodus is obvious but the paul's letter to philemon is sometimes not cited it sometimes was cited often by pro-slavery advocates who didn't look under the text to really see the essence of the text and um this is a short letter that paul writes to um, Philemon is a person who he knows, um, and it's about his Paul's relationship with a slave who is Onesimus, and they meet in jail. Um, and so Onesimus is um, Philemon's slave, and Onesimus has stolen something from Philemon, and that could get him killed in Roman, according to Roman law. And so you have Paul, who's a Roman citizen. You've got Onesimus, who's a slave, and then you've got Philemon, who's a slave owner. You get these three different people, and you kind of get a slice of their three different existences. Paul's in jail. Onesimus is in jail and a slave, and he could theoretically be killed. Um, and then you have um, Philemon, who's a slave owner. And so they're all different. And you see Paul talking about Onesimus in interesting kinds of ways. And so Paul 
talks to Anissim is he, he, according to the text, he brings him to a relationship with the Lord. And he starts to talk about Anissim not as a slave, but as a brother. And he says in his letter, he sends Onesimus back to his master. And of course, pro-slavery advocates will say, yes, he sent him back to his master. But there's a lot more to this. He sends him back, yes, but he sends him asking Philemon to do more for Onesimus, to see him as more than just a slave, but a brother. And so, whereas we may want Paul to say, slavery is wrong and all this, and yes, I do too. Paul does something else. He says, see him as a brother, more than a slave. And in a sense, I see that as kind of breaking down these walls that exist between people because slavery is, the institution of slavery that still exists is a socioeconomic class barrier in a sense. Yes, American slavery was about race, but it's also about class. And historically, people have been enslaved because they've been of a lower socioeconomic status. If people saw other people as brothers and sisters, would those walls that exist between us, the walls of race, the walls of class, the walls of socioeconomic distinctions, would they exist and would we be a better people if we tore those walls down and didn't see each other through the things that divide us? And I think that that's what Paul is saying. He's probably talking to himself saying that maybe I saw Onesimus as different than me, but in my relationship with him, I started to break down the barriers that I once had with Onesimus. And now I want his master to see him as more than a brother, or more than a slave, but a dear brother. And so to bring people into a state of brotherhood, even today is difficult. The things that divide us, Republican, Democrat, Black, White, Hispanic, all of those things, can we tear those walls down? Can we break those barriers? and find the humanity in one another, the brotherhood in one another. I think that's what Paul is trying to say. And that's why I opened with that story because there's more to it than just Paul sending him back. Paul sends him back with a request for Philemon to change. And then church tradition, if we, you know, depending, you know, church tradition says that probably Onis that Philemon does free him and that Onesimus becomes a bishop. Philemon dies as a martyr. Of course, Paul dies as a martyr. And so these three men, according to church tradition, really become one on one accord. And I think that's the story here is that these three diff different people could be united on one accord. And that's a beautiful story, man. I thought that was why I wanted to open with that story because there was much more to it than just what meets the eye. If you look under the surface, you saw something greater. And you saw something that really unites us, that gets beyond just what we want, but into our common humanity. I love that. What a great way. I Thank you for lifting the hood under that one for us. You know, I also love um, in reading your book, the ways in which you explore aspects of prominent African-Americans who came before us. It's very timely because a week from today is uh, the MLK, holiday, Martin Luther, Martin Luther King. But what I love about the book is that you use storytelling in the way of approaching some, I guess, some taboos within Christianity. And when I say that, I mean that in the first part of your book, you talk about how too many Christians are compelled to reject the reality of suffering as being part of their Christian journey. And you weave in parts of Phyllis Wheatley's history, which in reading the book, I didn't really know that about looking at the history from Phyllis Wheatley from that perspective. Can you share a little bit more about that? What's the lesson in the Phyllis Wheatley story that you think Christians need to know and consider? And perhaps not everyone necessarily knows, knows of Phyllis Wheatley, but, but may not know exactly the contribution she made. So maybe you can give a little context there too. Phyllis Wheatley, um who many black high schools and schools are named after, was the first black poet in America. And I think the first black woman to be published in the world, um, black African-American woman to be published in the world. And so her legacy is secure, but she's a woman who was stripped out of her homeland by the time she was eight years old. So she doesn't have 
hardly any memories of her mother and her family. And so here's this basically orphan child who's transversing the Atlantic, you know, the middle passage, which is a horrible passage in which everything is stripped from black people as they make that transition from Africa to the America, to the new world. And yet she's at such a young age, it had to even be more traumatic for her because she doesn't have that much of a foundation because she's so young. And as she comes to America, her name is the name, Phyllis is the name of the ship that brought her here. And Wheatley was the name of the family that, that bought her. And so we don't even know what her name was back, her original name was back in Africa. Um, and so, and yet you feel the suffering because she yearns for who she was. She yearns for her mother. Um, and she experienced a horrific, in a sense, the Middle Passage was a, as I said, a horrific experience and something that she had experienced basically alone. And I think of that as, the essence of suffering. And that's the Black experience through the Middle Passage was basically suffering. And then I started to juxtapose that ideal of suffering and a biblical ideal of suffering, because if you think about the Bible, suffering is throughout the Bible. It's an experience that we all have. And, 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 and even when you think about the Old Testament and the New Testament, the New Testament even tells us that we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that sufferings produce endurance. And we think about Jesus on the cross and his passion, and that was about suffering. And yet, I think in American Christianity, we sometimes think that suffering is not a part of our experience. We think of it as just prosperity, and that if we are Christian, if we are people of faith, we don't have to suffer. We don't have to go through those things. And yet, the scriptures are very clear that we will endure sufferings and that that is a part and experience of life. And I'm not celebrating Phyllis Wheatley's suffering. I feel horrible about it and it torments me. But then I look at the ways that she weaved her suffering into her poetry and there's a beauty in it in which she exposes her life for all of us to see and yet to recognize her humanity in that world. And I think that that's a part of her life, which was difficult and yet horrific on one end and yet so amazing on the other. And that this woman who comes to, comes to the U.S. at about eight becomes such a practitioner of language, learning different languages, learning a new lifestyle experiences and learning how her place is within this society in the revolutionary period. It's an amazing story, an amazing journey, and yet one that we don't get the fullness of it because she's dead by the time she's 40, but yet her legacy is secure. And so that's who Phyllis Wheatley is. She's a poet, but much more than that, she places her experiences that are sometimes difficult for us to understand. And sometimes her views are difficult for us to understand because she doesn't become what we want her to be exactly, but she's what she needs to be for her life to find joy in the times of her suffering. Wow. And you know, <coughs> what I love about that is that's a, a great way to break it down. I did not discuss this with you, so you will have to forgive me. Uh, okay. I'm gonna throw you a curveball because I, I got to break out. <laughs> You're gonna be fine. <laughs> what what I what I wanted to say to you is that you're really open in this book about your personal struggles with depression and suffering. Yes. And so I just think that based on all that's happened in the last two years, right? It's it's a collective. We're trying to be okay. And some days we're not okay. I'm seeing people nod, right? Like, and so what I'm wondering is, can you share a little bit about that, that struggle and how you open up in your book about your own experiences with, with grappling um, with mental health? You know, depression is something that I've become quite acquainted with, or anxiety, however we define it. Um, 
since I was really in high school, at least. It's something that I think my family has dealt with. And we know that these things run in families. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that, you know, I didn't understand because in our community, in the Black community, it's not something that we discuss. We say, you can pray that away or, you know, you need to be stronger and, you know, can a, can a Black man feel this way? If you're not a man, a real man doesn't feel sad and things like that. And so we're not always taught to open ourselves up. And I've, you know, I was very fortunate that I had a family. My mother and father were very open to me. Although sometimes my father was not as open about struggles. But if you think about what the black experience is and has been, one can understand how these kinds of issues can persist. Issues of doubt, issues of questioning, issues of wondering what your place is. And then of course the realities of just life and sometimes perhaps chemical imbalances. I, I, I you know, but it's something that, you know, I had to receive help for, um, that I had to seek professionals. Um, it's something that I went on medicine for. Um, it's something that I had to struggle when I was able to get off of the medicine because it created withdrawals and a horrific experience um, with that. Um, but so in a sense, depression is suffering in a way, um, but it's also an opportunity to, when I think about my experiences and it's a continuing experience, um, I have joy today, but I have to fight for joy at times but it links me with other people that I'm able to understand those experiences. And it creates community because I think it humbles me in a way that maybe if I didn't have to experience that, I wouldn't feel it. And maybe that makes me more human. Mm -hmm. And so the struggles that I have, I wouldn't change because I think they make me a better person a more humble person, a person that gets it, I think, the struggles that many of us have. And so I see that as an experience, but I also see in so many other people those same experiences. And perhaps if we can find a way for particularly communities of color, I think, to talk about depression, particularly in regards to men. I think we're a little more open when we talk about women struggling with things than men. Um, maybe we'll be in a better place. I look at suicide rates in America and the numbers of black men committing suicide has gone up tremendously over the last five, seven years. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's because of a lot of things that are going on right now in regards to this period of reckoning about race but it's also because we don't talk about issues of doubt and suffering and just not feeling good. And we don't often take the time to focus on what we need. Sometimes we only think about the outside society. We don't focus on the things that we need to survive. And COVID has created another layer of issues that I would not be surprised if it leads to other kinds of issues on this regards, if not treated. Mm -hmm. And I know I went off on a tangent there, but it's, you know, suffering and depression are things that are nothing to be ashamed about. Right. Initially, I felt that way. I felt it was my shame. Mm. Um, I've grown to embrace it as who I am. Wow. Thank you for being so transparent. Um, and David just said, David Rogers, he said for a connection to Howard, but he had, he had been depressed and said once that when he stopped praying, God delivered me from my depression to Lord, to help me to learn what good will come from this depressive episode. That's when things began to change. So thank you, David, for that comment. I appreciate that. Um, we're going to, I have one more question. And then what we're going to do is we're going to open it up for Q and A. This is also really cool because we we camped out on this question uh, <laughs> last week and we had so much fun, but it was it was really interesting. So I've been able to develop a relationship with you and I've learned a lot about you and your passion for music. 
And I'm a huge Kendrick Lamar fan myself, right? And so shout out if, raise your hand if you know who Kendrick Lamar is. Can I get a hand raise? Anybody? Yay, awesome. Okay, I saw some hands. Um, Kendrick Lamar is a um, black rapper and it was really so interesting to see how, to hear you speak about the juxtaposition of sacred and secular music. Um, I never thought about some of these artists that you talk about referencing and highlighting their faith. So for example, in your book, you talk about Thomas Dorsey and Kendrick Lamar, and you make a comparison in the book. It's in chapter six, pages 212 and 213. So you guys, I cannot wait until you all get this book. Um, we have something special planned for you, but um, you said something in your book on page 213. When I consider Kendrick Lamar, who's the rapper, I realize that it's hard on the surface to identify his music as Christian. And you talk about how Kendrick Lamar was born during the height of the drug wars in Compton. You talk about his song, ADHD. You talk about how he witnessed mass incarceration of young black men. And, but then you go on to talk a little bit about some of his songs where he talks about that begin with the sinner's prayer and how he makes references to his face, right? So can you just share a little bit about that juxtaposition of like, what made you start to compare? I mean, I know you're like an old Virginia soul boy, right? Where you, those of you who don't know Carrie, he paid, was it the trombone or the trumpet? Trombone. Trombone, okay. And majored in music almost, didn't you say I, you almost- I almost started that way, yes. Okay, so we're talking about like a music, aficionado here right like so why but why are you making juxtapositions between secular and christian music and what's up with the kendrick lamar reference so the whole thing about sacred and secular as we think about the european world and basically ideals and all a lot of it's european and the distinctions between sacred and secular are so great and so when you think of what's good and what's religious and what's not. And so we think of blues music as not religious and gospel music as religious. And so that was the juxtaposition that Thomas Dorsey, who really we see as the founder of gospel, modern day gospel music found himself, not the Thomas Dorsey, the trombone player, but Thomas A. Dorsey, the African-American man who um, wrote so many of the great gospel songs that we now listen to and enjoy. And Thomas A. Dorsey was a person raised in the church, but when he moved from Atlanta to Chicago, he gets brought into the blues world. And so he's playing with Ma Rainey. He's hanging out at, at, at the worst kinds of clubs and <laughs> writing songs that are as profane as profane can get. And yet he's going to church and playing for choirs. And then when they find out that he's in this blues world, they're like, oh, we, we can't have you up in here because you are part of the blues world. And the idea of the blues is that they, they think that many times people thought that blues people made a deal with the devil. And because they made a deal with the devil to learn how to play like Robert Johnson and Crossroads Blues, that they couldn't be part of this gospel world either. And so Thomas Dorsey is caught be between the world that he's making a lot of money in uh -huh. with the blues and the world he's not making any money in gospel and it drives him to the hospital he's depressed as well he's got people saying you're not christian enough you're not good enough and one of the things about the christian world is sometimes we judge people so harshly that we push them out of the church mm -hmm. and we push them outside because we are who say that we are supposed to be people above love sometimes don't show that love to other people and sometimes it turns against uh, us against each other as we try to make them fit into what we think of as Christians and to the dichotomies that we've set up. Right. And so Thomas Dorsey found himself in that world. And historically, even ever since that, we've made distinctions of who is and who isn't. And that caught him. It caught Aretha Franklin, if you think about it. You know, when she did her gospel album in 1970, some people were like, she shouldn't be doing that because she's part of the pop world or the R&B world. 
and we see that up through Prince too. And then we come up and we see a Kendrick Lamar who, yes, his music is profane. And no, I would not be playing it in a church. But yet you see the struggle in him as well. And so you see this, this profanity on one end, which you saw with Thomas Dorsey. And yet there's this other side of Kendrick Lamar that's starting to come out. And so it's interesting to me when you think of it, and I don't know what's going to become of Kendrick Lamar. I don't know where he's going to be five years from now, but it's an interesting thing to think of that maybe the same things that we've seen in the past, we see happening again. That's so good. You know what? So I'm going to throw this out here because what I love about the book is at the end of every chapter, you have like this explore your faith section. And after you tell these stories about Kendrick Lamar and Chance the Rapper, um, you ask a question, like us to, just to sit and ponder. And I want us to sit with this for a second before I open it up. But the question you asked in the book, I'm just gonna read it. How can more mature Christians be better supporters of young people just coming to the faith and not push them away? What ways, do we all need redemption and reunion? And what role can we all play to ensure that our fellow, fellow Christians do not feel abandoned and, and lonely, especially those who are different from us? And I, I, love, I love that, Carrie, because um, you talked about Kendrick Lamar, but you talked about Chance the Rapper. And Chance the Rapper is like the goody two shoes, right? Like he's yeah. the... And yet he also expresses his faith in a yeah. different way. And yet he also had gone through so many different things, drug abuses and other kinds of things, you know, that, you know, when you think of the struggle and the process, um, if we push people out at their time of greatest need, we slam a door. And I think that that's one thing as a person who's been inside of the church, we sometimes slam the door in the people that need it the most. And we don't open ourselves up. I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, I was once told that I shouldn't talk about, not from my pastor, who's been tremendous in the whole experience and gets it. But I remember once being told at a church, I won't say where or when, that a Christian should never talk about depression in a church. And I felt like I was almost being pushed out because that was my experience. Wow. Um, I've heard people say a person shouldn't dress like this in the church. You can only come in a church in a suit and tie. Now I'm old school, so I believe in wearing a suit and tie. But <laughs> do you push a person out if they don't have a suit and tie? Um, so these are things in which if a person isn't acting the way they should be acting, that's the time when they need the most. I think about the prodigal son. You know, the prodigal son wasn't living right, but the father loved him enough to go after him in a sense. He didn't say, get out, you're banished forever. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I find that that's what we do so much is that we spend a lot of time banishing and not loving. You know, Ooh. there is judgment and we get that, mm. but we have to love enough and then help. Right. And sometimes we are so broken. One last snip breaks the foundation. And, and, and I think of that as a society too. It's not, this is, these are just not things about the church. We have a society right now in which if you don't believe the way that I believe, I break you, I cancel you, I throw you out. If you're not a Democrat, if you're not a Republican, and, and I'm one of those two, I can't hang out with you anymore. Mm -hmm. That's the same kind of attitude. And I think that we have to work to transform that attitude a little bit out of love. And then maybe out of humility as well, because a person who's humble doesn't automatically assume that the other person is wrong. 
or that the other person has to act the same way that I act, or that I have to be a Baptist and that you have to be. You have to be just like me. But a person who's arrogant feels that way. A person that's open and is assured of who they are is a little bit more open and they're a little bit more understanding and accepting. Huh. Don't worry, be humble, like Kendrick Lamar said. <laughs> well, okay, this was powerful. We could keep going and you could keep going and I keep could be, keep literally letting you go because you just keep dropping all these nuggets, Carrie. But I do want to open it up to the group. I see some comments and I see people saying things, but perhaps um, some folks might have some questions or comments that they would like to share like to share with us. So I'm going to go ahead and open this up for some comments and Q&A. Um, does anyone have a specific question for Carrie as it relates to some of the topics he's talked about from his book? Patton, have a question. Get, yeah, I can get us started. Um, thank you, Carrie. Thanks for your book and for being here with us today. Um, I, I have a couple questions um, and I, I kind of want to get back to Phyllis Wheatley, but I'm going to hold off on her for a moment because um, I want to kind of just keep in the flow of what you and Zachary were just talking about. And also the comment that Marcus left in the chat just now. Um, I agree with what Marcus said, that that's a really, really powerful, accurate um, uh, description. At the beginning, uh, Dakri asked you about uh, Paul's letter that you quoted in your book. And in talking about Paul, about Paul you asked, um, can we break those barriers and try to find the humanity in one another? And man, I mean, kind of, again, uh, resonant with what Marcus was quoting. That just seems harder than ever right now, um, just in the sort of the waters of our culture to break barriers and find humanity in each other. Um, and I just, is that your sense too? Like, is it harder right now or does it just feel that way? Um, and I think also... it may be and it may not be. Um, and the reason why I say it may be is because we have so many, we have so many more venues of communication, but we have in those same venues are ways to exclude. And when I say exclude, if I don't want to deal with you, Patton, I can just defriend you from Facebook. I can cut you from Twitter. And I think we've created a mentality of exclusion in the way that we communicate because we're not forced to be around each other. If I don't like the school that I'm in, I take my kid out of the public school, I send him to a private school or vice versa. And so I think we have so many options today that it creates kind of like consumerism in which we make ourselves consumers of everything and because we're consumers then we can exclude ourselves from the things that are uncomfortable if we don't like living in this neighborhood we just move to another neighborhood that's more likely more people like us and so i think in every way we have those options and because we have those options it leads to our worst impulses of separation and yet at the same time I have to think of how difficult it must have been for my parents who grew up in a segregated society to live and to exist. Um, and my goodness, I, I could not imagine communication across the lines that they had to communicate across. And so it's easier for us to communicate and yet we're making it more difficult because of the options I think that we have. And I'm not saying that those options are bad, but we're not always using those options for good. We're using them sometimes for bad. Um, and I think because we have those options, can we find ways of using them for the good? But that's down to us. We have to make those choices. And to make the choices of communication and communication across boundaries and barriers and walls, we have to make ourselves vulnerable because that means that we might have to compromise a little bit ourselves. It can't all be on our terms. And we want things on our terms, right? But it can't be. Communication has to extend 
and bring in. It's like, it's like I think of the cross for me, you know, it extends up and down, but outwardly as well. And so in our communication, we must do the same thing. We must be up and down, but we also must reach out. And that means humbling ourselves and making ourselves vulnerable. And that's not easy when we don't want to be vulnerable. Democrats don't want to be vulnerable to Republicans. Republicans don't want to be vulnerable to Democrats. Black people don't want to be vulnerable in this way. White people don't want to be vulnerable in that way. But we have to be, and we have to say with empathy, if I were this person, how might I feel? Instead of always, how do I feel? And I think that's a part of it as well. As we've been trained so much to think of only ourselves that we don't think of others. And unless if we do that, we can't bridge. I think when Paul was looking at Onesimus, he was thinking of himself. And of course, they had a lot in common at that point because they both were in a prison cell in a sense. They both were incarcerated. And so I think that brought unity between them. Would Paul have thought the same way if he wasn't in that prison cell at that point? I don't know, but it brought a commonality. And we must find those points of commonality, those points of common humanity. And then that's what leads us to starting the communication and the conversation. Yeah. I just want to add one thing and then I'll, I'll let it go uh, or go to someone else, which is that I, I guess I'm, I'll confess that I'm skeptical that that can happen on the mediums that you're talking about. Like I, I think my, my um, faith in those platforms as being a space where we can do this well, I mean, people do it, but I think mostly what's needed is to get out get off from behind these screens when we can safely <laughs> and have, you know, uh, be in more intimate settings with people in person, you know, in, uh, uh, in their homes and their, in their, whatever their context is, be willing to go to places that where we might not be comfortable with people that whose views we might not share, um, take a chance to get out, literally get our bodies outside of those bubbles and interact with people face to face. I agree with you. I think sometimes we have to we cannot be so dependent on social media to do all of our work for us. It's different when you're sitting next to another person and you feel their breath in a sense. We can't do that now because we get COVID, but we can't, when you can feel a person, when you can reach out and touch that person, it's different than when you see them through a computer screen. When you see them through a computer screen, it's so easy to get rid of them, but when you are right in front of them, I think there's a personal contact, a personal touch that's much more difficult to exclude. That's good, that's so good. I have a question. I see a Perry actually put a question in chat. I wanted to talk about that a little bit and see if you could answer that for us, Carrie. She said, I read that most church going people are no longer receiving their catechism through the church, but through media, including social media. Wondering what you think about that. And it's kind of like what you're talking about, but maybe you could just elaborate a little bit more on- I think that context. now, because of what we're dealing with, that may be what we have to do. Um, but I hope, to me, and I'm just gonna bring this into the church broadly, it's something beautiful when people, how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity and harmony. I think of that as a church. When we come together, there's an experience that I love, the singing, the joy that comes when you link hands with somebody and when you touch somebody, when we have an altar call and we all have hands united, we're on one accord. The media doesn't do that for me. Social media doesn't do that for me, but can it bring a person into a better relationship? I'm open to all kinds of ways that does that. Um, so I think there's, for me, a preferable way, and that's in person. But maybe there are other ways as well. I'm not going to say that one way is the only way, but I do think that the personal touch the personal church, the feeling church, there's something about it. You know, I think about the apostles and they were all together on one accord because they were, they were united together. I think there was something special with that because they could touch each other. They could support each other and they could feel 
one another. I think when it becomes like a market and a meat market, it's a little different. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a little easier for us to fall into the things that divide us. Yeah, that's good. But I, I, I see that Perry came back. Um, I do think that, and if I'm, and maybe I'm not quite getting everything, but I do think because it's social media, you're not going to always get truth and good teaching too. There's a lot of stuff out there. And so the foundations of whether it be the catechisms or, you know, the doctrine, there's a lot of stuff out there that probably is not always good if that's all you're getting. Um, I think sound teaching is important. And one of the ways that you get sound teaching is to be taught and to not just kind of skip around here and there. I hope I'm getting closer to what you are. You're definitely getting closer. I would love, I don't want to mispronounce the name. Is it PR? PR. PR. Okay. So PR said, I wanted to hear a little bit more about your method and your writing price process. As I was reading, there were some folks that I was so intrigued by, Ethel Waters, Duke Ellington, Maria Stewart. Um, you can't cover everything, but can you go a little bit deeper? Payar, did you want to did you want to share or ask the question? There's quite a bit in here. When did you feel compelled to weave scripture into a reading of a particular figure? Well, this is a good one. I can start with that. Um, you know, I, I, I started each chapter and I, I, I organized it by period, time period. And so, you know, that gave me those time periods. And then I thought about, um, what were the ideas of the time period and the distinctions? And so um, within that, you saw Phyllis Wheatley and Cyrus Bustel in the earlier chapters had some different views than the people in the second chapter, the Mariah Stewarts and the others. And so the periods create some of the distinctions. And then within those distinctions, I started to think about how do, are they looking at scripture and interpreting scripture? And what are the things that they're dealing with and what's leading them to interpret scriptures? in different ways, I mean, not differently, but leading them to link with certain scriptures over other scriptures. And so for Phyllis Wheatley, she's growing up and living in a time period of where slavery in her mind might be on the way out. And people are in the revolutionary period, they're talking about freedom and you feel a change. And then in the next chapter, the cotton gin has basically destroyed that. And so there's a little more anger in that second chapter with the Mariah Stewart's and the David Walker's and the Nat Turner's, but they're interpreting scripture strongly as well and they're faithful to it. But there's a little more edge in that second chapter because of the time. And so they're thinking about scriptures and they're thinking about the Exodus and things like that and let my people go. And they're thinking about no man can serve two masters. And so in that way, as you dive into and you try to get into it, you try to think of how they would see that scripture and what scriptures are connecting with them. And then as we come up towards the current times the Ethel Waters and the Duke Ellington's, um, I look at Duke Ellington as a person who was in the secular world, the jazz world, and he was struggling for his own identity. You know, he had managers who were kind of using him and wanting him to be one way. And then he had to kind of get rid of the manager. And then he found himself. And so after the 1940s, you see a change in Duke Ellington. And then he gets a much more rigorous, um, you know, his music becomes much more edgier. We don't, it's not as pop music anymore. It's not, it don't mean a thing if you ain't got that swing, mm -hmm. but it's jump for joy. It's other things talking about African-American identity. And then religion comes in it towards the end of his life. And then as he gets towards the end of his life, as he looks back at his life and he feels his own fragility, you feel how that faith comes into it. And so in looking at a person's existence, 
as they talk about their faith, you look at it over their whole lives, if you can, if you have those documents. And then the scripture kind of comes into it. The faith kind of comes into it. And then, of course, you start to think, if I were in that position, what would I be feeling? And so a Thomas Dorsey would fit the same thing. And Ethel Waters, you know, my God, the woman grew up in a red light district. She was basically homeless at times. And she talks about her feelings of herself and how her faith gave her identity in herself at a later point in time. Some of it comes naturally. Others, you really have to sit down, take some time, pray, um, and just hope that you get it right. Yeah. Wow, that's good. This has been an incredible session. Um, thank you so much for everyone who's weighed in. We had, we've talked a lot, a lot about issues that really impact us in this moment. So this feels very relevant. Um, thank you for all that asked questions. We need to wrap it up um, because I want to be cognizant of everyone's time. Um, as a special gift for being here today, um, what we're planning to do is something different. We haven't done this before, but we're actually are getting copies of this book and Carrie offered to autograph the book for us. So we're gonna do a random drawing for everybody that hopped on today. And we're gonna get in touch with you within the week via email um, to let you know if you got an autographed copy of the book and we're gonna to send to you. So that's gonna be a special treat. Um, you can also get Carrie's book on Amazon, um, which is also available. And I think Jessica is gonna drop the link there. And in the next coming months, um, we're going to be inviting you to continue to this journey with us. And Carrie, we are very thankful for you. Thank you so much for sharing your book with us. Um, what we want to do now is we want to take a moment, just a quick moment, for you all to complete the Zoom poll for us. Um, we want to know how we did. So we want to go ahead. We're going to go ahead and launch that right now for you. And just take a, four simple questions um, as you're reading this, just take a moment to, to uh, answer that for us. And if you're new to our work, you wanna make sure that you, you subscribe to our Echoes magazine. Jessica's gonna put a link in that, in the chat for that. Um, and we wanna make sure that you are on the lookout for our next issue, where we're gonna be highlighting some of the work we've done, some of the events that have taken place last fall um, Carrie came to one of those events at the Carver. We have a couple people on here who joined that with us, but we're going to have more of those so that we can get to know our San Antonio neighbors. Um, we're also going to drop a link in the chat for you guys to get the book if you want to go ahead and purchase Carrie's book. So that should be coming your way. And um, I'm just thankful. I'm so super thankful to you, Carrie, for hopping on here this afternoon to share this with us. Again, this you, you all, this literally just came. he said so um yeah so this is great and it's it's a wonderful read I mean there's so much that we did not cover here um that's why you got to get the book so <laughs> thanks so much for joining us everybody we're super excited that you're you were able to happen to join us for this evening this afternoon and we will make sure that you all are notified I'm excited about the drawing so get the book and then if you get the draw if you actually end up getting chosen for the drawing you just share got the two. book yeah you got two so you could share it you could share the book everyone have a wonderful afternoon if i may say could i say i wanted yeah. to thank the he butt foundation as well and for all of your work to daiquiri and jessica and Patton and others for all of your work in the community and you know i've been inspired by your story as well and the story of, you know, the founder really of, you know, all of this and his story. Um, I've just been so impressed and I'm so happy to be part of this family, if you will. Oh, and Dr. Carrie Lattimore, we are so happy to have you. Thank you so much for hopping on here. And uh, it's so good to see the faith and the history come together in the completion of who you are. So this has just been a special gift. Everyone have a wonderful lunch. 
Um, we will be sharing this replay with folks if you want, if you were able to see the whole thing, great. But if you were not and you want to catch the replay, feel free to email us, but we should have it out for you all tomorrow. So we're really excited and thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye, y'all.